narratives are a way for people to talk through an issue. It lets them assign blame as well as affix responsibility, as well as negotiate any moral boundaries and assist in finding the appropriate course of action. Narratives work both in the context of those that are suffering as well as uh, those that are supporting them in social support networks or in institutional settings or in the healer setting more broadly. Frank's 1995 work describes three different types of narrative. The restitution narrative involving the restoration of health, and these are stories that are told to people when they are ill that there is essentially hope. The story of individuals who were able to overcome uh, disease, overcome illness in the past, and feel better overall. And these might even be stories that individuals are telling themselves. Uh, and, t and telling uh, their friends. Chaos stories, this is uh, marked by increasing anxiety, decreasing healthy uh, uh, outcomes or potentialities, conveying a sense of powerlessness overall. Finally, the quest narrative, the individual may not recover, but nevertheless they have reached a higher plane, um, so that through this uh, disease, through this uh, suffering that they've gone through, they have, and uh, in, in the illness, they have reached a higher state of consciousness, a higher plane. Uh, they, they're able to, to a certain extent, transcend the self. I'd like to talk a little bit about embodied experience here. And Singer and Bear draw from um, a number of different theorists uh, who have really helped to shape uh, thought over the anthropology of the body uh, as uh, both historically as well as more contemporary work. Uh, the idea of embodied experience is experiencing the world within our bodies which of course will internalize cultural meaning. We feel invasive forces, the self-non-self dichotomy that Napier talks about and Stoller talks about, and uh, safety is looked at as the elimination of the non-self through uh, waging a war against this external enemy. And Singer and Bear talk about Ronald Reagan's discussion, of, for example, of, of cancer, of not having cancer, um, but fighting that, 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 that cancer itself is, is part of the non-self. In biomedicine, there's a tendency to separate the body from the non-body, and this is certainly a, a flashpoint, a point of tension for both practitioners of biomedicine uh, as well as their patients. And increasingly uh, within biomedicine, we see responses including the embracing of complementary and alternative medicines uh, to look at different ways of uh, integration of the body, of the physical body with other parts uh, of the self overall. Foucault's work um, you can see it over here uh, to the right, uh, the birth of the clinic and an archaeology of medical perception. He looks at the rise of disciplinary power, of uh, how disciplinary power essentially tracks and helps to maintain the body through the clinical gaze where you have the exertion of power over the body of individuals uh, as a whole. Burdu looks at the shape, speech, and gait of the body as part of physical capital which influences one's position within society. Turner looks at modern communities moving towards a somatic society where you see the body becoming ever more central in both political as well as cultured, uh, cultural activity. Singer and Bear have a small subsection on engendered bodies where they talk about different body types and what the ideal body type looks like. They mention just briefly anorexia in the United States uh, versus uh, other cultural settings where you don't have the embracement and the embracing of a very thin body type overall. There's a discussion of the machine metaphor and thinking about the body as a whole and a little bit of discussion on menstruation as failed reproduction. And then there's the honor-shame dichotomy wherein the woman's body becomes a site uh, for anxieties over morality within the community or within uh, a particular family. And so uh, Asensio's piece that we'll actually be addressing later in the class talks a little bit about this uh, in the uh, virgin whore dichotomy uh, throughout um, Latin America and, and well, 
which Asensio is very careful to note that this is in fact an overgeneralization of, of the approach overall. Nevertheless, it's not something that uh, healthcare providers should embrace because of the uh, quandaries that it creates in terms of interpersonal violence. Finally, uh, looking at healer and sufferer conceptions of disease. So both the patient and the provider, the healer and the sufferer, are considered here. And Singer and Baer do note that doctors are out of compliance with evidence-based guidelines. Um, and they adherence to those guidelines is by no means uniform. In fact, Eddy in 1990 described the adherence as being often arbitrary uh, in terms of evidence-based work. The failure of doctors to recognize patient explanations will devalue the patients. Uh, patients in turn will be less likely to respect uh, because they feel disrespected and follow the advice of the doctors because it's not, it is not rooted in cultural understanding of illness. So it completely is a discrediting of um, the patient's explanation. Uh, the patient self import, uh, assessment is important in considering health, health outcomes and Singer and Bear note a couple of examples where this is very important for uh, that, that patients are actually very good at uh, self-assessing and seeing where they're at and how likely they are to recover. Um, the, another example that they give is a test for HIV with saliva and how this sends a, the wrong message to patients. Essentially, if you're testing for HIV with a, a, an oral uh, test, this can, led patients to believe that it could be spread in a variety of ways, including kissing, and they were less likely to take solid steps to prevent the spread of HIV uh, because they thought it was just going to be pervasive and out there um, overall. Um, uh, finally, is the, there's the discussion of Wills' work in, in medical discourse in Singer and Bear, and we'll be touching on this later on in the semester as we uh, discuss um, Wills' article. So in summary, we've looked at the conceptualization of health, disease, and illness, and we see very clearly from Singer and Bear how those different concepts interrelate with one another from the perspective of medical anthropologists. Uh, Singer and Bear provide some folk understandings of health. We will get more into this in the discussion of ethnomedicine and medical pluralism as the semester continues on. Uh, I talked a little bit about uh, Mur Murdoch's work with the Human Relation Area Files, or HRAF, and the typologies of ill health. We discussed the sufferer experience. We looked at disability and its implications in terms of normativity. Uh, we further discussed stigmatization uh, in terms of uh, stigma that attach to a uh, particular disease or illness. Um, and again, this again ties in with people not necessarily wanting to know. Anytime anthropologists talk about human rights, we, when we talk about human rights in a universal framework and uh, the delivery of those human rights, uh, there are certainly questions of ethnocentrism and cultural relativism that come to the fore. We will discuss those uh, in class. We discussed uh, illness narratives and indeed many of the ethnographic pieces that you have over the course of the semester that we'll be covering uh, focus very strongly on illness narratives. We talked about embodied experiences around the idea of gender, Rudeau's notion of physical capital, uh, Foucault, Foucault's idea of uh, disciplinary power, and we also looked at healer and sufferer conceptions of disease. Okay, uh, well, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys in class and doing more work on this and discussing uh, this further.